This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook, and I'm here with my colleague Beck Guild. Beck, how are you? Yeah, really well. What about you? <laughs> um, Another match. So day. day six, day six of the Eighth Biocidicals Research Symposium today. We've heard from Amanda Archibald the second time, and we've mm. also just heard from Amy Skilton as well. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, there's so much to learn. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean. For those who don't know, obviously, um, it's Amy's session was on chronic inflammatory response syndrome, and that that's actually still I would consider a fairly kind of new um, area of healthcare, mm. a yeah. very a very probably under under recognised area, and of course, um, Amy has become an expert on this by necessity because she's had to live through a water damaged building. Uh, induced health issue herself so yes, um that's right. that's exactly yeah right. and uh, so many layers to it isn't there that's right uh, isn't it amazing how um and it's not just in the naturopathic community i find this in the orthodox community as well people very often become an expert in a condition mm. when it affects them yes and that's when they start to question the status quo and, you know, other than that, it's their disease. But once it's, sorry, somebody else's disease, once it's their disease, yeah. it becomes something which they really need to find the answers for. And we've seen that we see this in orthodoxy as well. Yeah. Um, Nothing motivates you to help the connect the dots than if you're yeah. living through it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Chris O'Brien Lifehouse. Chris O'Brien was a head and neck surgeon who poo-pooed natural medicine until he got head and neck cancer you know uh, um yes. total there's an awful about... lot of people who've gone through kind of um a health issue who've come from a complementary medicine is bad or black snake oil only to come through with some kind of chronic health issue where medicine didn't provide sufficient Biotin. answers and and That's in particular just... You know, cancer is a great example because it's the, the removal of or the, the ability to ride out chemotherapy will oftentimes happen a lot more readily for people who are undergoing care through, you know, yeah. naturopathic methods. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let's go to Amanda's yes. uh, talk first or talks first. So I, I really thought she brought up some interesting things and especially I've got to say in the case history, but in her talk, what I love about Amanda is the way that she puts or uses genetic information, SNP information, not as a diagnostic, but as she said, her toolbox. Mm. And she puts them in these boxes so that you can ponder them. And, and another point that she made was that she lets the data speak to her. She doesn't, she's very mindful not to make up her mind ahead of time. Mm, yeah, she says so that, that DNA won't replace clinical nutrition but that yeah. it just, it sort of helps to provide us with some guidance and direction. Yeah. So there's like, there's so many notes I've taken from her. Mm. Um, not, not the least of which was the very simple things that, that we can do making a good vinaigrette. I, I mean, yeah. with, you know, and might I just add by using some Australian extra virgin olive oil, um, because we know how how many issues there are with imported oils. We've seen that. Mm. One I don't think all the sued. Australian ones are no. exempt from that. <laughs> yeah, well, one company in America was sued, $14 million or $11 million, because they lied. Um, there were not, there were oils that were not on the label and they weren't extra virgin olive oil. Mm. With Australian extra virgin olive oils, yes. particularly if they've got the Australian Olive Oil Institute, um, um, logo on there, then you can be guaranteed that they are the authentic material. Mm. Little plug there um, <laughs> by Australian. Mm. But, but you know, I mean, so many notes. Um, oh, gosh. Where, yeah, where to start? begin? I'll, I'll oh, tell you one of the oh, things yeah. I've highlighted. Yeah. Um, that I think she really drove this home throughout her session um, this morning, the plenary, but that 
that it's not just about kind of what foods we provide and what genetic impact they're going to have, but we also as clinicians need to be mindful of the forgotten story behind how those foods are prepared, which she's absolutely right. It's such a forgotten element in healthcare that, um, you know, and, and some of the things, the findings that she had summarized were really telling, you know, really telling, really Even telling. Soaking, soaking lint, um, not lentils, chickpeas in mm. brine. Yes. You know, yes. and that it doesn't affect the salt content much of the brine. Indeed, it mm. might add a tiny bit of flavour. But mm. what it does was bind to the calcium ions and therefore break that sort of lectin shell, if you like, of the hardness of the, cow, of the coating mm. so that you can then cook them. And I was just like, ah. Oh. But, of course, the sad thing was when you buy canned chickpeas, it's mm. like, oh, man, start back at zero. Yeah, well, I did write that down that um, for chickpeas that in can in the canning process, and she was talking specifically about folate because, of course, it was a really deep dive into that. But, you know, a can of chickpeas will result in around about a 77% loss of your um, folate, folate material. Yeah, whereas obviously if you – and if you buy – boiled things you know you'd lose around about half depending on the food and um but interestingly microwaving doesn't result in very much nutrient yeah. loss that was like <laughs> but that's but that's nutrient loss mm. what else does it do well that's yes a well we must make sure that we're microwaving in glass argument. not plastic particularly I've if got you've got say... detox gene issues well, I've got to say, like, we, we do use our microwave um, quite regularly. I won't say frequently, but regularly for one thing, and that is the heat wheat. Um, <laughs> I may or may not make honey carrots in mine. <laughs> um, but, but one of the other things that she said, which I thought was a very nice little term, and that was ROI. Anybody in business would think it's return on investment, but she says, no, it's return on ingestion. Hmm. And I thought that was really quaint. It was really cool. <laughs> um, but uh, the other one was uh, there was a few um, nice little um, plugs, if you like, for, for different companies that she used, like one called Chronometer hmm. um, for dietary recall. Summarising you know, the nutrition. I, I these are nice little useful tools that we can all go, yeah, that works. I might use this. Hmm. Or you know and nice how thinking. useful it would be to have somebody like amanda like i know she works um with other clinicians so other clinicians will kind of obtain this data and then pass it on to her and then she kind of deciphers it and writes a report and passes it back to the managing clinician which you know how good would it be to have an amanda at your beck and call to be able to yeah. do that <laughs> so yeah. good. well also um how good would it be to have dr denise Furness? at your beck and call and there was i mean i'm going to do a plug here that course that course really opened my eyes mm. and um, of course that course is you're talking about the one offered by bioceuticals it's called dna in practice it's specifically for clinicians yeah. just in case anybody is wondering yeah but it's for clinicians and it's non-branded and uh, you know that's what i like about it it's yes bioceuticals hosts it but it's about the SNPs. It's about yeah. the information and how to do it properly, how to, how to interpret SNP information properly and ethically. Yes. Um, that's what I like about Denise's stance. Yes. She's very strong on that. Ethically um, was... and with a scientific underpinning as well, mm -hmm. because I think there's still, much like the microbiome, there's still an awful lot of things we don't know yet. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so what was the other one? Um, uh We've spoken about the impact of cooking and, and steaming. What about um, fermenting? Yeah, fermenting was a really good one. Yeah, Naffled I wrote that down. I love, I love the ferments, you know that. So I've, I wrote oh. that she was showing, um, obviously she was talking about nutrient loss, but there were mm. actually a couple of nutrients within the fermentation and that's, this was talking about beans. So I, I can't say we can categorically apply this to all ferments. But um, yeah. in fermented beans, interestingly, the zinc and the vitamin K went up. So every mm. other nutrient resulted in a, you know, a very small loss. And I mean small, like compared to every other method, you know, it was virtually neg negligible. But that, that went up and the starch content went up. Now, those are really important nutrients, as we know. Zinc is a universal cofactor. Vitamin, um, not vitamin K, a potassium. I wasn't 
not vitamin potassium. K, potassium K plus. I've written it down. Yeah, yeah. And um, but 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 it was the the their availability, correct? Well, she was not talking about their availability. She was talking on well, what I recall on that slide was on about nutrient loss. But I looked at the slide and I'm like, hang on a minute, those nutrients were gains. They they actually improved the yield through the, the fermentation yield. That's process. Right. Hmm. That's right. Yeah. So so we're talking about the return on ingestion we're talking about not what's in there but what can we use mm. and this is a key thing isn't it like mm. we know that you know phytic acid binds to minerals including zinc and mm. iron and therefore renders them less absorbable so by destroying that phytic acid via cooking methods then we can make them more bioavailable or available um um, and this is the key thing about what we're talking about with cooking. The other thing that that was mentioned in there was um, using a constant lower heat as well. Now, my sons have actually trained me on this. You know, I mean... They've taught you how to cook. <laughs> yeah. Cook better. You yeah. know, Dad, turn it down. Stop mm. flaming it. You know, stop. Just turn it down. Mm. Um, and I've indeed... Uh, instigated that with my barbecuing now, my barbecue, mine. Um, <laughs> but that's my thing. You know, I love my barbie and and they've taught me to just cook it at a little bit lower temperature. Sear it maybe, but cook it lower. And I'm going to tell you, the steaks are so much more beautiful now. Mm. Yes. Come around, everyone. Oh. <laughs> um, preservation of the nutrients probably adds a little oh. something, something to the flavour. <laughs> Yeah, but so moving on to Amanda's case history, that, that was something where I kept on remembering Detisa's comments yesterday and, and just how um, in, interwoven or, or web-like these problems can be. So when she was talking about the issues of case one, what was going through my mind was, is there neuroinflammation? How early do we have to look for inflammation? When should we suspect this? Mm. Are there any telltale signs and symptoms or signals that might be pathognomonic to say, hey, wait a minute, there's something going on. And I was reminded by Detisa's case history yesterday about this mm. and, and the, the touching the nose and touch his, his, touching his finger. What was it called? The, I forget the, what the name of the... the yeah, like basically the shudder at the end. When, when she was touching his finger. Oh, it's like, yeah, like a tremor before she got to the target. Tremor, yeah, that's yep. right. Terminal tremor, terminal tremor. And just these really simple things that we could do, even if we had no real suspicion of neuroinflammation, mm. maybe, maybe we, we might pick up an extra case that might require intervention. Mm. Wouldn't that be great? Mm. Yeah, yeah so well, I don't more. think... Neuroinflammation isn't necessarily something that um, the average, you know, um, doctor is probably totally on the lookout for. No, it, they wait for a patho pathology to be existing. Yeah, you know, and I have the same thing with um, several cases I'm thinking of that I've seen, you know, um, thyroid antibodies through the roof, like really high off the chart levels. And their doctor has said, no, no. Oh. It's not causing well. any problems. Come back to me when it's You're causing well. problems. Yeah, like 10 years. <laughs> yeah, but no strategy to reduce said problem or the fact that there could be these underlying factors, which we've learned about all weekend, haven't we? You know, dysbiosis, chronic inflammation, problems with nutrient access through um, SNPs, aberrations in SNPs and pathways. Like, I think the thing I liked with Amanda's cases was at, same like last week when we um, saw her session as well was, you know, she cl classifies them into these little, she calls them buckets. So I think traditionally I've received the genetic information and I've pulled up all my pathways and I've tried to sketch them out on the pathway documents. Right. Whereas the way she's doing it is that she's clustering them into categories that are based yes. on healthcare. So she's talking about, you know, the, in, it, maybe the digestive system or lipid metabolism or neuroinflammation, and she's clustering them together. And you can start to see that as that box gets bigger and bigger with those pathways, well, that's an area you need to pay a little bit more attention to. And I really right. like that because it's a lot like when we used to do, um, I forget the program I used to use when I had a clinic, but it, 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 
it used to do like a full questionnaire and then it would populate a document that gave you kind of like a bar graph of where mm. everyone's problems were. And it would be like, okay, this person needs their liver health addressed or this person needs their digestive health addressed. So in a similar way, the genes mapped out like that really helped you, as she always says, you know, help to provide a bit of a blueprint or a pathway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, w when I was viewing my SNP information, and and I was coming from this, yeah, how mad am I? Um, <laughs> but but at the beginning, I started going, oh my goodness, I need this supplement, this supplement, this supplement, this, and then I went whoa back, whoa yeah. back. Yeah, it's easy and to I get at, reductionist. Yeah, it's easy. yeah, and then I went, okay, what are the existing issues that I feel I need? Mm. And are there any ones that might feed into that that might be silent? And lo and behold, there was three things that I needed. It was just, yeah. yeah. I led. loved in the case as well, how she was able to show like the patient's um, family history and that there yeah. were these kind of things in the family history. And then when you went back and you looked at her genes, you're like, well, you know, she's got these SNPs that affect her cholesterol you know, production, which in turn has an impact on steroid hormone pathways and this and that. Like, was there any wonder there was, you know, heart attack and heart disease or um, um, there was, I think, even like a suicide or whatever in, within her family yeah, history. Yeah, that was really sad. And you start, but you start to see, like, how these kind of patterns do get passed on from generation to generation. I love that. It's like putting pieces Absolutely. of the puzzle together. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that that answered or might... But, I wouldn't say answered, but shed some light on for me was years ago, or we're talking decades, the, the uh, collar gog formula, formulae were called fat metabolizers, you know, and it was methionine, choline, and inositol, B group vitamins, maybe a little bit of St. Mary's thistle, heaven mm. forbid. Globe artichoke wasn't even on the scene back then. <laughs> um, Not unless you're a and, herbalist. And, yep. Well... I think it might have been before the availability of that, but um, okay. a while then. A while. So the thing that these SNPs answers it to me is: could there be a, a an issue with the LDL receptor? And might you'd have to check by therapy, but might the use of things like phosphatidylcholine, which we know are involved in the what's called the cholesterol triad with bile acids, lecithin, and then the, um, the level of cholesterol in your blood. It's the, called the cholesterol triad. Look it up. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, no, I'm not talking, guy. talking to our viewers. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, once, you, once you decrease the amount of available lecithins, then you'll get to a point where the cholesterol starts to supersaturate. That's when you're at risk of having a seed, crystallization formation and indeed something like a, bar, a gallstone formation um, right. because you've now got a seed for it to, to, to grow from. Mm. Really interesting stuff. And Amanda was talking about just simple interventions like lecithin, phosphatidylcholine, mm. bang. Mm. I mean, how simple are these? Yeah. Um, and obviously she's, um, she's doing all of this with the, the brush stroke of kind of a dietetics background as well. So it was very yes. focused in on focused dietary strategies. I mean, she really is the poster child for creating the culinary map that we might use to understand why we would impact or we would import certain foods into someone's diet to impact these pathways. So I think um, what I also loved about the way she was putting it together and again, emphasizing the impact of food as medicine, but she would give her patients the listing of the, the master ingredients that they needed to include. And then these influencer ingredients influencer, as well. Yes. Yeah. So hence yeah. your thing about the, um, the vinaigrette and what have you, like we can, it brings a whole new um, way of thinking about flavor enhancers anyway, like the real yeah. ones, not the ones with the numbers. And, and not the least of which the correct way to spell vinaigrette. Um, <laughs> But, I didn't um, notice that. I, I, <laughs> there is that. I probably have my um, head down writing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I actually looked up straight away. As soon as I heard her talking about vinaigrette, straight away I was looking up how to make a vinaigrette because I remember the, um, the tip about how do you form an emulsion rather than 
a combination, sorry. An emulsion, yeah, I don't know. A, a true emulsion, so that won't, that won't crack, it won't separate. Um, uh, rather yeah. than, I can't remember the other term. But anyway, so there was a few other interesting things that she brought up. And one of the things was testing for toxins. Hmm. And particularly the chemical, which I've never heard of before, was alpha keto phenyl acetic acid, which, nice. which had to do with styrenes. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the world of the 21st century plastic environment. Mm. And I thought that was just such a key thing. Like the takeaway um, food containers, you mean? Well, not, no, not the, not the least of which. They've actually found plastics in feces of scientific volunteers. It was actually, um, there was a, a scientist over in London who had colleagues in Italy, Japan and America, maybe, not Australia. Um, they sent, I know, they sent samples, this is pre-COVID, they sent samples of their faecal material, friends, to this colleague in London hmm. who looked and found visible clumps of plastic in their faeces. Yeah, microplastics are Free, a massive Not issue. even micro, macro. 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 I mean, this is worrisome. I'm getting a sieve. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe I might do that test. <laughs> you need a friend so you can post your food to. <laughs> need a friend. Nobody? Um, but what was the other one I, I learned as, as well? The central fatigue hypothesis. I thought this was really interesting but confusing to me. Um, and it was talking about an increased serotonin to dopamine ratio. Um, causing fatigue and if you could sway that decreasing the serotonin and increasing the dopamine mm. then that improved performance and and I, I was quizzical about that going serotonin is bad I thought that was the alertness neurotransmitter and then I thought hang on what happens when you give an SSRI what's one of the side effects or, or the effects indeed of an SSRI flattened effect a feeling of being zomb zombied out drug mm. and I thought Oh, maybe this answers these side effects. Maybe we should be looking at dopamine mm. nourishment, but, but not one, not so much like that. That one's higher than the other or lower than the other, but that yes. in relationship to each other. Yeah, the ratio. Yeah. Yes. Um. I, sometimes I think we can get caught up in the fact that oh, this must be low or this must be high. They always both exist. That's we right. Kind of, it's kind of the balance or the difference between point A and point B that we probably need to pay attention to. Yeah. I mean, you, you extrapolate that to hormones, mm. you know, yeah. I'm things. thinking of estrogen as I say that actually yeah, estrogen to progesterone ratio yeah. rather than yeah. estrogen dominance, which, yeah. you know, I have real issues with that term. Yeah. It's one yeah. of my pet hate terms. Um, but one of the other key things I cottoned on to as well was um, the, the influence of taurine in transulfuration and I remembered last year's symposium what Jay Lombard was talking about about it's one of the most powerful nutrients you can use to help to sort of um, do I say the word dampen control um, even prevent protect against um, neuroinflammation and neurological damage mm. in traumatic brain Mm. And I thought that was a real telling thing when we're when we're looking at this case history that she was um, she was discussing, particularly as you say, with that history of depression suicide. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, this is another thing I'm quite grateful for yeah. this year is that this is the most symposium content I've ever been able to watch from end to end because I don't have to be running around getting everything sorted out for the <laughs> for the FX Absolutely. Medicine lives and and what have you. I know. I, like I've I've got to say. I, I really, I miss being there and, and chatting to people at the breaks and, mm. and networking and catching up with old friends. I, I do. I miss that that face-to-face -face being. Mm. But I really am enjoying this new platform of delivery. Mm. I really am enjoying it. Yeah, I'm definitely going to make more time to go through and devour some of the... Um, the past years, I mean, we are in the eighth year now, so there's, you know, seven years of, 
seven plus years worth of plenary um, sort of sessions in there that I could go back and revisit. But review all of these. But, but there was another thought um, that I had, and that was, again, I am missing the face-to-face -face contact, but let's not just think about us. What about the planet? Mm. What about the footprint of people flying in to see the symposium mm. of the uh, plastic ware that's used in delivering meals? Mm. You know, I, I mean, da, 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 the, the list goes on. What throwaway disposable uh, items don't have to be used? and don't have to therefore cause pollution like plastic in our feces, yeah. you know, yeah. by delivering well, like the online. printed, the printed kind of conference yeah. notes. Yeah. I think um, it's, you know, we can have them digitally now. Do we, do we have to print them? We can, hmm. we can write upon and annotate um, notes using a stylus on an iPad or if you want to keep writing or you can put type in words over the top if, if, if you so wanted to, I think is, this is the opportunity now for us to kind of adapt the way we've always yeah. done things so that we can be yeah. a little bit greener in the footprint that we're doing over time as well. Absolutely. And, you know, talking about engagement, what I've, one of the things I've really enjoyed was watching people engage, not just with the speakers by asking questions, but also engaging with themselves. Okay. Introduce, hi, I'm from Western Australia. It's like 5am here. Good on you, Sally. Mm -hmm. um, but, but people talking to Sally. Yes asking yes. questions amongst themselves to clarify things. Yes. I've loved this. It's yes. been one of the most wonderful things to see mm. where it's almost like they're at the same table going, hi, I've never met you before, but what's the answer? What did they say? Yeah. And that I mean, everyone was it. coming from different, like in some instances, different backgrounds, different modalities. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I agree that what, watching what people were kind of coming out with or you know, inputting some of their like, well, I use this or I did this or I tried that or aside from their questions, which are yeah. always outstanding. But um, yeah, I'd have to agree with you. So anyway, Absolutely. we've, we've uh, probably talked for long enough. We, we, should, <laughs> long uh... enough. we could talk for a long time. I know, I know. But Nobody needs that. I, I, I just want to make a, a small comment about Amy's talk as well. I mean, as you say, by necessity, by God, that woman has learnt so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, she blows me away by, by her, it's not just dedication, we're talking about a fire that's burning in her to, to, to awaken people to the incidence, mm. prevalence of this, of water damaged buildings, but also the prevalence of SIRS and, and what's going on underneath that we find really hard to, you know, put a finger on, uh, on mm. the pulse if you put a finger on, on the issue at hand. Um, and indeed, she woke me up to an issue when it was her and Nicole Bilsma, when Nicole said, oh, no, it's, it's way more, the issue of water damage buildings is way more than what we thought. And I said, no, our house is, is rock solid. Uh -uh. No, 1970s building code on a flat roof house with box gutters doesn't mm. exist. Yeah. So we actually got um, water damaged um, Eves and which is undergoing repair at the moment. And but water damage as well is not always obvious. You know, oftentimes it takes to see the sagging and the in the roof or the wall cavity, whatever it yeah. might be, or visible mould. But mould can be an issue way before you can see it. And in Amy's yes. case, with her own experience, there was no visible mould in her apartment. Right. And yet, when they went in with that. Ermi meter, I yeah. think it is. Yeah, the, Ermi, the, the Ermi meter to do the, the amount of test. spores was off the charts, yeah. off the charts. So um, I I know that since seeing Amy go through this, I've really been a lot more conscious of that. And I really say to people who say, "Oh, I've got bit mold or water damage," like you actually really need to pay attention to that. You really need to do a lot more to that to treat it than just spray a bit of bleach over it and scrub it off. Oh. Like it can be a much bigger and much deeper issue. So, yep. um, yeah, she's done a lot for bringing awareness in my world. Oh, boy, in my world as well. So, anyway, guys, thank you for joining us today. Beck, thanks very much for yes, taking the end of another great your... weekend. <laughs> yeah, another great weekend. Time to <laughs> sleep. But, again, can't wait for next weekend where we've got Detise and, uh, Carrie. and Carrie Jones, forgive yep. me, and Carrie Jones giving their yep. second plenaries and second case 
um, case histories that should be great to learn from. Yes, and the panel. Oh, how can I forget the panel? Now, this will be really interesting, won't it, mm -hmm. to see the, the different mind and the different viewpoints of Detise, Carrie and Amanda. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Bill Walsh won't be there. I think Mark and Amy will both be yes. in attendance as well. Yes. So they'll give their view. But that'll be really interesting. Controversial to say the least. Always yes. a great yes. thing to listen to. Yes. Who doesn't love, who does, who doesn't love getting a meeting of the minds? It's one of the yes. best parts. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with debate as well. No. And I have it on so good authority you. that once again, like last year, this year, FX Medicine will be able to deliver that. It won't be on the day, but we will um, have that available to our audiences um, probably a week or so later for, for anyone yeah. who didn't get to come along. So that's exciting. Yeah. We'll edit out the shouting and the swearing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks so much for that. joining us today on FX Medicine. Now I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook and this is Beck Gill. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week.